Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I never liked the wording of the Confession of Sins in the old Lutheran hymnal. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. It always struck me as strange that at the very moment in the worship service when we celebrate the freedom of Christ's forgiveness, we begin by groveling in guilt. Calling yourself a poor, miserable sinner is a bit harsh, don't you think? It feels like the hymnal is kicking a man while he's already down. Most people already come to church because they know they're sinners. That's why they're here, to hear God's good news about grace not to get their consciences beaten up. Furthermore, as one parishioner pointed out to me a long time ago, why should I confess all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you if my past sins have already been confessed and forgiven? The psalmist says that as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord promises that I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So if God forgives and forgets, then how come I can't forgive and forget about my own sins? Yet despite my feelings, perhaps there is actually something helpful about remembering our past sins, precisely because they are forgiven. After all, feelings are rarely a good litmus test for theological truth or spiritual reality. Feelings will deceive and mislead you. The scriptures will never mislead you. Time and again, throughout the Bible, for some reason, sinners reflect on their past sins. For example, in Psalm 51, even after he was forgiven for his affair with Bathsheba, David writes, My sin is ever before me. And in our epistle lesson, the Apostle Paul calls himself the foremost sinner. Or as the King James Version has it, the chief of sinners. Why would Paul speak of himself in this shocking way? After all, he's a hero of the faith. St. Paul, one of the greatest missionaries ever to live. His credentials included the fact that he was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher by God. And that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the very command of God. So why would Paul, this pastor of all people, let alone a pastor of Paul's stature, speak so disparagingly of himself? Was this simply part of that self-deprecating way in which some preachers speak of themselves for humorous effect? No. Despite Paul's high calling, he remained ever mindful of his past. He never forgot where he came from. The Apostle Paul and nearly everyone around him remembered his dark past. How previously he was a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent man. No doubt some of you will remember the way that Paul served as the coat check for the men who stoned Stephen to death. How he held the cloaks of those that were killing a man for preaching the gospel so that their coats wouldn't get dusty. Now at the time, Paul was known by a different name, Saul. Saul of Tarsus. And in Acts 8, Luke tells us that Saul approved of Stephen's execution. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. In fact, it was on his way to Damascus in order to arrest Christians when Saul, Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord met Jesus in a blinding light on that Damascus road. Saul, Saul, Jesus asked, why are you persecuting me? And that very day, Paul put an end to his violent persecution of the church. He came to faith in this extraordinary conversion, probably one of the biggest personal turnarounds of anyone in history. Several days later, he was baptized. Yet even in those early days of his beginning as a believer in Christ, the Lord said of Paul, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name to kings, to Gentiles, and to the children of Israel. 
God did amazing things through the Apostle Paul. He racked up more miles in his missionary journeys than probably any of you will ever get in your freaking flyer program. He founded churches on two continents. He was persecuted for preaching the very faith that he once tried to destroy. And at various times, he was shipwrecked, beaten, and left for dead, stoned, mocked. Eventually, he paid the ultimate price for his preaching, and he was beheaded, executed for preaching the gospel in the city of Rome. And still, Paul never forgot where he, the chief of sinners, came from. Throughout his epistles, he makes frequent mention of his evil past. And despite his amazing ministry record, he himself admitted that I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And yet it was not because of the guilty conscience that Paul kept bringing up his past as a violent and wicked persecutor. He didn't try out his conversion story as some kind of emotional appeal for people that are always impressed by stories of prodigals and changed lives. To the contrary, Paul talked about his past because it pointed to the even greater grace of God. As he says, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Twice in our epistle, Paul writes, I received mercy. I received mercy. Because despite everything that Paul had done in his past, Jesus Christ had done even more for Paul. Paul repeats and recounts the story of his past, not as an apology, but to show how great is the grace of God. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. All of this is to say that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the ones that he calls. He gives grace to the humble, even if he must humble them himself before he shows them grace. And so Paul's life becomes a story of hope and encouragement for all of us. Because if God can forgive a sorry sinner like Paul, the foremost, the chief of sinners, then certainly he can and he will forgive sinners like us. Sometimes I think that we should have a sign posted outside of our church that says, No perfect people allowed. But that wouldn't work because then we couldn't let Jesus come in. So maybe a better sign would be, All sinners welcome. Because the church is not a dusty museum of saints. It is a hospital for sinners. Heaven is full of scoundrels. Because every saint has a past. Not just Paul, but also you and I. All of us have said and done and thought things that would horrify, absolutely horrify our friends and our family and our fellow believers if they knew what our hearts are really like. Because we are poor, miserable sinners. And none of us deserves God's grace. And yet there's no need to cower in fear or grovel in guilt because Jesus freely and fully gives and forgives in perfect love. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Jesus came to save sinners and died on the cross, not because we're so wonderful and good, but precisely because we are a wicked scoundrel. And yes, while Jesus sometimes did associate with those holier-than-thou Pharisees puffed up with pride, the Gospels tell us that Jesus much preferred to hang out with the downcast and the outcast, the worst of the worst. As the Pharisees charged in our Gospel, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus was the friend of sinners, and he still is. At no point was this driven home more powerfully in my life than the time that I celebrated communion in a maximum security prison in Illinois. During my first academic quarter at seminary in St. Louis, I had to select an institutional institutional module in order to experience some of the work that chaplains do. So a hospital, a nursing home, 
or prison, something of that sort. And I chose prison ministry. Now, most weeks, a few of my fellow seminarians and I would gather at the Madison County Juvenile Detention Center where we would lead Bible study and sing some praise songs on the guitar with troubled youth from East St. Louis. And yet, towards the end of the term, the chaplain took us to the state men's prison so that we could see what hard time really looks like. On the drive to the prison, I asked the chaplain if there were murderers and rapists there. I was a little nervous. <laughs> of course, he snapped. But don't ask anyone what they did, because it's rude to ask. And most of them will lie to you about it anyway. After we arrived, we passed through security and underwent a pat-down. The prison guards carefully scrutinized our identification and compared it to the FBI background checks that we had to undergo a few weeks earlier in order to be cleared to visit. And then we listened to that clang of the doors as they locked us in. We ate our dinner in the prison cafeteria. And by the way, despite what I'm sure you've heard, which is, oh, they eat these excellent steak dinners every night and lobster tails. No, it was canned green beans that were about three years old. It, it's terrible. Prison food is terrible. I can tell you that from experience. And as we sat there eating in the very same place where the prisoners were eating, I kept nervously looking over my shoulder, wondering if our conspicuousness made us easy targets for taking hostage in the event of a prison riot. Finally, we went to the chapel where there was just a very small lectern and a little rickety communion rail made out of two-by-fours. And we seminarians handed out Bibles and hymnals to the prisoners as they arrived for worship. And as the inmates gathered for worship, I cringed, trying to figure out by appearance which ones were the murderers and which ones were the rapists. What was I doing in a place like this? But when the time came to kneel at the communion rail, I realized that there was no essential difference between them and me. Because whether a murderer, a rapist, or a seminarian, we were all sinners. And we were all brothers in Christ. And Jesus died for them the same as he did for me. And the same body and blood that were given to me by Jesus were the same body and blood given to them. How humbling. How wonderful. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. Jesus welcomes sinners to his table and he feeds us with his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper is not for good people. The Lord's Supper is for sinners. Like the Pharisees said of Jesus, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Yes, because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Paul's words today remind me of one of my favorite hymns, the words of which apply not only to Paul, but also to us. Chief of sinners though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Live that I might live on high, live that I might never die. As the branch is to the vine, I am his, and he is mine. Truly, God's searching, seeking love for sinners never ends. Not for those who are to believe in him for eternal life. This is the reason why Paul breaks into a beautiful doxology at the end of our epistle and he says, To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.